Welcome to Brain Info Live for everyone in the brain health community. Brain Info Live is about hope, health, support, education, and you. Whether you're living with Alzheimer's or a caregiver, family member, or loved one of someone who is, Brain Info Live is here for everybody. Hello, I'm Dr. Sharon Cohen. I'm a neurologist and I'm the medical director and principal investigator of Toronto Memory Program in Toronto, Canada. I'd like to welcome you to this very special national episode of Brain Info Live. If you, our viewers, have any concerns, we strongly encourage you to seek further information or go to our resources that you'll see at the end of this session. You can watch this episode and others, as well as sign up for emails by visiting braininfolive.com. And now let's turn to a video that Phil made that was produced by Bright Focus Foundation. just knew that I wasn't the high performing person I used to be. Pieces of my past are being erased. I was lucky we caught this at the very earliest stages. I hope that my story can give other people hope. There is life to be lived. Increasingly there will be treatments. We need to invest even more in research and finding treatments and cures. If your loved one or you yourself are sitting there thinking something is wrong, I'm not who I used to be, you can get some answers and you can get them for free. Wonderful. I'm sitting here now with Phil and I'll read a little bit about him. Phil Gutis was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's disease in 2016 at the age of 54. After receiving a diagnosis and going public with his story, Phil has become a critical advocate and key voice for those with dementia for the last several years. He has collaborated extensively with organizations like the Alzheimer's Association and the Bright Focus Foundation to share his story. And we are very fortunate that Phil is doing so today with us. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. It's a pleasure to be here pleasure having you. Phil, you had a unique introduction to Alzheimer's disease. Can you tell us a little bit about what you first noticed? What tipped you off that something wasn't right? So it's interesting. I, I don't remember truthfully. Um, I know that I had been complaining that something was wrong, that I really felt that my brain wasn't working the way it used to. And apparently I complained so much uh, to my sister and my, and my husband and probably anybody who would listen uh, that my sister saw an ad on Facebook for a clinical trial for those experiencing memory, memory concerns. And she sent it to me and she said, you might want to look into this. And I did. I went to the, the clinical site and I, I sensed a great deal of skepticism there because I did and still do present fairly well, but we went into the, the cognitive testing and I didn't pass. And uh, you could tell the energy in the room changed because they realized they might have a live one. Right, right. So you yourself had noticed something, continued for a while, your sister encouraged you to take this forward and you got a clearer diagnosis. And was there a research study that was uh, involved in this process of getting a diagnosis or subsequently? Yes, I uh, turned out, I did not know this at the time, but it turned out that I was uh, going to be part of the um, Biogen trial for aducanumab, um, which many years later turned out to be the first ever FDA approved disease modifying uh, drug uh, uh, approved for Alzheimer's. So, you know, I, I often say, and I've written many times that I never really expected 
the clinical trial to benefit me. The, the history of clinical trials and drugs was littered um, with failures. And I just wanted to be part of finding a cure for this disease. You know, it wasn't that I necessarily thought that I was going to get cured. It was just important that I be part of finding a cure. And we're so grateful that you did participate and did contribute very important data. As you say, aducanumab was the first disease modifier and has led to other breakthroughs and still more to come in the future. So thank you. We, we owe you a debt uh, for your participation, not just for yourself, but for those who come after you. You know, people with young onset Alzheimer's disease are at a different phase of life than seniors who are retired and they're often working or building their career or, you know, in the midst of still raising families or with financial obligations that perhaps later in life we don't have. What was it like for you in the workplace? How did you navigate that? So I had left the crazy job that I had where I was supervising 50 people and traveling almost nonstop. And I was freelancing and I started to feel that I was having trouble getting assignments done. And then I started to work almost like part-time at a very small not-for-profit near my home. And I think when I actually got my diagnosis, I was serving as the executive director and director of one person uh, for this not-for-profit. And even that became challenging. So I had to finally even step down from that. It, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. I think from the folks I've talked to, they almost immediately have to step down from their jobs because, um, you know, any job involves deadlines. Any job involves, you know, responsibility, right? You all have responsibility when you have a job. And it becomes increasingly difficult to, to do those things. The challenge then becomes, what are you going to do with yourself, <laughs> right? Because you're still, you know, a productive member of society. And even if you have to step down from your job and even if you go on disability, you still have all these hours of the day where you can be, you can do something. And I, I always recommend to people, find something to do, find, volunteer, advocate for yourself and for others living with the disease, get involved in something that you care about, find a hobby. Uh, I know a woman who was the president of a university who took up painting. She'd never painted before, and now she does the most extraordinary paintings. So, you know, you have to keep challenging yourself, even if it's not through worth. Because if you just sit in a corner and feel sorry for yourself, your mind's going to go even faster. <laughs> well, you describe it in a very uh, positive and optimistic way. What, was it a more dark feeling initially? Or how, what was that feeling when you were first diagnosed? And how did it evolve over time? There were a lot of tears. I mean, you know, we have to we have to be honest, right? This is life changing information that, uh, as I, I often say, you know, your life, your, your entire life is turned upside down. And, um, you know, now looking back, it's been seven years, I say, you have to learn to walk on the ceiling because you have to still be able to walk, right? I mean, you can't just sit there and say, oh, it's, you know, my life is over. Particularly because if this is caught in the earliest stages, you may have another 20 years of life, right? Um, you know, I'm much more likely to get hit by a bus right now than I am to die from Alzheimer's tomorrow. Um, uh, now, when I was diagnosed, I did not know this. And um, there was a, a famous women's basketball coach named Pat Summit. She died right around when I was diagnosed and she died from early onset Alzheimer's. And she lived five years. 
after diagnosis. Now, who knows how long she was masking and all that sort of stuff, but she lived for five years post-diagnosis. I didn't know any better, and I thought that was my time frame. And five years is not all that long, right? Um, so, you know, often people are told, get your affairs in order, Do make sure you have your will, make sure you have all the legal documents. And we actually even got married, my husband and I, <laughs> because I wanted to make sure we'd been together for 10 years or so, never felt any real need to get married, but um, it became critical because I wanted to make sure that he was able to um, speak up for me when I no longer had a voice to speak and make sure that my, my um, interests were, were being followed. So, you know, obviously I'm seven years in, I'm not dead. Um, and I think for most people, I know cases where it does move very quickly. And I think there's a difference and Dr. Cohen, I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say about this, between younger onset Alzheimer's and um, early Alzheimer's. Yeah. yeah, no, you've made so many, so many very relevant points here. I think that, um, you know, early Alzheimer's really speaks to early symptoms. Uh, people are still functioning pretty well you know, either mild cognitive impairment, still independent in day-to-day -day function or some things, you know, not quite independent, but lots that one can do. That's the early Alzheimer's bit. But early onset by definition means symptoms begin under the age of 65 years. And for some people that's in their 50s, it could even be in their 40s. So that's, that's you know, speaking to the stage of life one's at when one is confronted with a bad disease. And you described so well, Phil, that the trajectory of the disease can be quite variable. Um, some people have only a few years, others may have many years, and we don't have the best way to predict for any one individual how long this will play out. But we do think diagnosing early gives people a better chance to cope, to accommodate, to use strategies, to avail themselves of medications, or in your case, clinical trial that, you know, uh, prolongs the, the milder stage of disease. These are all so important. So you, you're, you're very inspiring in your, your messages. How did you speak to family about this, to your, your, your now husband or your friends? How, did you keep it inside or did you share it or how, how did that play out? I'm laughing because I don't keep anything inside. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the first thing I knew within, I, I, I say minutes, but moments, certainly weeks that I was going to write about this, right? I was a New York Times reporter. I've been involved in communications my entire life. So you know, my reaction was to, I'm going to write about this. And, you know, I worked in advocacy organizations, so I knew I was probably going to advocate, you know, on behalf of uh, those of us living with this cognitive illness. And I believe my first phone call was the Alzheimer's Association to the press office. Um, because again, I knew I wanted to write about it. So I figured that was a great place to begin to understand you know, what was going on with me and how I could begin to make a difference. And I've been writing fairly consistently now. And I'm delighted to say that I still have the ability to write, um, you know, seven years in and uh, still talking to the Alzheimer's Association folks. I, I saw you, Dr. Cohen, in the hallway at uh, the AAIC conference. I stumbled upon you in San Diego um, you know, we were walking down this massive convention center and just saw each other. Um, I, you know, I went to that conference and as a reporter and, uh, I wrote, I, th I thought, you know, I don't know, I don't want to say this about my own writing, but I was pretty pleased with what I covered and what I wrote at the conference and that I was able to do that, um, and contribute that way. So, yeah, uh. You know, and so once I decided I was going to go public to bring it back to the question, there was no, there was no 
sense of, oh my God, I have to hide this. You know, and I hear that from a lot of people that they feel like because of the stigma that they have to hide this, that, you know, Alzheimer's mm -hmm. comes with a stigma. People are afraid of their, what's going to happen with their jobs, afraid of what's going to happen with their families. And, you know, they're often the main uh, income generator, you know, what does that mean for the family? So they'll, they'll try to mask symptoms as long as they can. We, we've always been open, if I can just add one other thing, you know, one of the things that I, that I experienced um, fairly strongly was crowds, parties, loud settings. I couldn't handle them anymore. I would burst into tears and we would have to leave or we would not go because they, we knew I couldn't handle it. So, you know, in terms of like, oh, Phil doesn't like us anymore. Tim and Phil don't like us anymore because they can't go to the parties or they don't come to our parties or they don't come to our dinners. It's not that. It's literally, uh -huh. you know, can't handle it. I have words in two Thanksgivings, this family, Tim takes care of their, do their dogs and they, took us in his family and Thanksgiving, they had like 75 people in the house. It was a massive thing. Two years in a row, I had to leave in tears. It was just too much. You have to kind of be honest with people. Yeah, because how, how could they understand? You know, they're gonna draw their own conclusions. Right. Sorry you had to go through that. When you look back at the last several years, what would you say is the biggest challenge you've faced with this disease? Is there one thing that stands out above everything else or it's just a whole series of challenges? It's really a series of small challenges. Um, nothing, you know, nothing life shattering like a lot of people have to deal with, right? You know, I, I'm still, again, fairly functional, can present fairly well. We did drive to Florida for a family wedding, which we will never, ever, ever do again. <laughs> Could not handle the trip. We ended up, once we got to DC, it started pouring. I'm not a happy passenger anymore, even. And in the rain, it's really bad. And when it got to be nighttime, uh, a truck went by. We hydroplaned and I just burst into tears and said to Tim, get me out of this car now. We had been driving all day and we had to go find a hotel right away. And, you know, and I cry at weddings long before the bride shows up. So that's always fun too. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's these series of little challenges. Uh, you know, I, I don't remember a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I call them memory holes. I feel like things just don't get written on the hard drive. That's my brain. And so I'll have these conversations where people will say, you know, do you remember, which is of course, one of the phrases you should never use with a person living with a cognitive disease, but people do it all the time. Um, and I'm sitting there and going, no, I don't remember. And I've gotten into these like, we, there was a comedian that I loved and um, there was a performance I had been invited to and I couldn't go. And I was sitting at breakfast one day with a friend and I was telling her the story how I couldn't go to this thing and I was so disappointed. And she said, well, at least you've seen him live already. And I looked at her and I said, no, I haven't. I would remember that. And we went back and forth and she goes, I sold you the tickets. Of course you went. And I'm like, no, I wouldn't forget that. And I finally called my husband on the phone and said, did we see Randy Rainbow? And he said, yes. And I was like, I just started crying, of course, because how could I forget something like that? And there is no memory, none. Like I, I've tried so hard to find that memory and it's not there. So, you know, it doesn't impact me day to day. It's annoying as get all, but uh, you know, and those are the kind of things that, you know, finding clothes to wear in the morning, forcing myself into the shower. I've developed a fear of showering. Um, it's just, you know, there are all these somewhat smaller things that add up to 
I don't know. It compared to somebody living with cancer, you know, or you know, dealing with cancer or stuff like that, it feels kind of almost small to complain about, but it it yeah, I don't even know how to describe it. I'm I'm not finding the words. I think you're describing it really well. And it's a day by day sort of unpredictable challenges, at least, you know, with cancer, perhaps the limitations are more clear and you work around them. But with this, you know, you're having a conversation and all of a sudden, oh my goodness, there's holes in the memory or whatever it is, yeah. you know, or emotionally labile when you didn't expect to be or something's too much, whether it's the drive, you thought it was going to be fine. That unpredictability is hard to deal with. You describe it very well. What you, overall, in the time I've known you, you seem such a positive person. And despite all of these challenges and the stigma that the world brings to bear on this disease, you have been able to advocate, to be productive, to still, you know, report, uh, to attend conferences. It's because of you that we have this rich relationship and I'm grateful to you. You initiated it. Um, <laughs> What would you, t you've already told people, you know, don't just sit around, you got to do something to fill the time, even if you're not working. Are there some other pearls that you could share? Because you're obviously doing an excellent job of, uh, of managing this disease. Pearls of wisdom. Hmm. <laughs> I never think of myself as full of wisdom. Um, you know, find what you love and keep trying to do it. That, that really is what it's about if you love you know being around animals as i generally do except when they're interrupting my taping of things um you know maybe there's a shelter you can volunteer at or um you know volunteer to walk the dogs at the shelters or something you know i i know a lot of people get such joy out of that if you're in a position where you can adopt you know uh uh, we just got, I surprised my husband on Hanukkah with a kitten because we had lost one of our older cats last year. And he, I, you know, I, I had been, I spent the week before I had done all the, all the background stuff and everything. And I spent the week saying, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And, um, you know, the minute that the kitten was put on his chest, he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but he just gives us so so much joy now you know watching this little creature learn the world it's just it's so much fun so uh, really find something you love and keep doing it until you can't anymore you know and if you can't do that then try to something different you know there's i've started doing legos right i started building legos because of a program i saw out at san diego where a lady was working with people living with cognitive diseases. And I, I love it. Now, there are times when the build gets complicated and I have serious trouble trying to figure out where bricks go and following directions and maps and things like that have never been my strong suit. They're horrible now. And sometimes I get very frustrated and I wonder what the bricks are telling me, you know, is it time for me to say, you can't do this anymore? And a couple of weeks will go by and I'll go look at it again and go, oh, okay, I can do this this way. So, you know, even if it's temporarily frustrating, this is not a straight line disease. That's one thing I've really learned is the progression is not going to be like this. There are going to be bumps and valleys and, you know, there are going to be times when things are more challenging and times when things are a little clearer and you're able to do a little bit more. So listen to your body, but push hard. I guess that's my basic guidance. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense to fight back. Your life is not over when you have Alzheimer's disease. Some things are harder an opportunity is there to be open and honest with people you care about so that they can understand and, and maybe the relationship even becomes closer. And in your case, you and your partner 
married. You know, it's, it's really interesting how people's priorities can come to the fore when we're faced with medical challenges. Um, uh, you know, you've described so many coping strategies, find something to do, do what you love, reach out to people. And if somebody's in the workplace, depending on one's job and how much one wants to continue, there may be accommodations that can be made, whether it's to do with deadlines or how one does one's work or the responsibilities. So again, life's not over. It's not going to be as carefree or easy, but there will still be richness to it. And I think that that's such a, such a great message. You communicate that very well. And whether it's Lego or painting or, you know, as human beings, we, we have so many ways of expressing ourselves and it's an opportunity maybe to find some other channels to express oneself. Phil, any, any last words you want uh, before I sum up? I, I guess the last word I would say is don't try to do it by yourself. Reach out to get help. Support groups are challenging at the early stages because you don't want to hear the stories of people living in the later stages. It's nothing you need to hear right now. <laughs> and I have sat on some of them and left horrified. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, friends, family, you're going to find the people who are going to be there for you. And I think that's the important thing. Couldn't agree more. And I'd like to truly thank Phil for wonderful advice, conversation, openness. We learned so much from you. We're grateful to you. And many thanks to Bright Focus Foundation and our viewers for tuning in.